In the previous lesson, we saw the scientific revolution change the world beyond recognition. We also emphasized that the scientific revolution was not the result of scientific research alone. This is because scientific research can flourish only in alliance with some religion or ideology or political force. The ideology justifies the cost of the research. In exchange, the ideology gets to influence the scientific agenda and to determine what to do with the discoveries of science. So if you really want to understand the scientific revolution and its development, you have to take into consideration the ideological, the political, and the economic forces that shaped the sciences of physics, of biology, or economics, pushing them toward certain destinations and not others. Of all the ideologies and all the political and economic forces that have shaped modern science, the two most important ones are European imperialism and capitalism. This lesson will be dedicated to understanding the relations between science on the one hand and European imperialism on the other hand, capitalism we will discuss in the next lesson. The first thing we need to realize regarding the rise of the European empires is how surprising it was. Before the modern era, Europe, and in particular Western Europe, was a poor and marginalized area of the world. Nothing of importance ever happened in Europe previously. Western Europe was never the center of any great empire prior to the modern age. Even the Roman Empire, the only important pre-modern European empire, derived most of its power and wealth from its North African and Middle Eastern provinces. The Western European provinces of the Roman Empire were a kind of Wild West, and they contributed little to the power and wealth of the empire except minerals and slaves. Northern Europe was so desolate and so barbarous in the times of the Romans that they didn't even bother to conquer it because they didn't think that there was anything there worth conquering. Similarly, no important religion or ideology came from Europe before the modern age. No great technological invention or economic system. Only at the end of the 15th century did Europe start to become a center of important military and political and cultural developments. Between 1500 and 1750, Western Europe gradually gained momentum and became the master of the outer world, meaning the two continents of America and the oceans. Yet, even in the 18th century, European states were still weaker than the great powers of Asia. Europeans managed to conquer America and the ocean, mainly because the great Asiatic powers of the Middle East and India and China showed very little interest in these areas. The early modern era was in fact a golden age for the non-European empires, like the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean, the Safavid Empire in Persia, the Mughal Empire in India, and the Chinese empires of the Ming and Qing dynasties. Even as late as 1775, Asia accounted for 80% of the world's economy. The combined economies of India and China alone represented about two-thirds of global production. In comparison with us, Asia, with Asia, in the late 18th century, Europe was still economically uh, insignificant or of little significance. The global center of power shifted from Asia to Europe only between 1750 and 1850, when in a series of conflicts, the European powers defeated and humiliated the Asian powers and conquered large parts of Asia itself. By the late 19th century, Europeans firmly controlled the whole world and the world's economy. 
1950, Western Europe and the United States together accounted for more than half of global economic production, whereas China was down to just 5% of the global production. The Europeans controlled not only the economy, they created a new global order, global political order, and a new global culture. And today, all humans are to a, to a, a large extent, a much greater extent than they usually want to admit, all humans are European in their thoughts, in their tastes, in the way that they see the world and behave. They may be fiercely anti-European, anti-Western in their rhetoric, but almost everyone on the planet views politics and medicine and the economy and war through European eyes. Even, say, the growing economy of China today, which may soon regain its uh, global uh, position as the, the giant of the, of the uh, world economy, even the Chinese economy is built today on European models of production and finance. So how was it that uh, the people of Europe managed to break out of their remote corner of the globe and conquer the whole world in no more than two or three centuries. European technology is often given much of the credit for this. And it's unquestionable that from 1850, more or less onwards, technology gave Europeans and Americans of European descent a clear superiority over everybody else. There was a common saying, for example, among European, European soldiers who fought in Africa against African enemies. This, the European soldiers used to say, whatever happens, we have machine guns and they don't. So don't, be, don't worry. But uh, this wasn't the case before 1850. Technology was far less important before 1850. Even as late as 1800, the technological gap between European Asian and African powers was relatively small. More importantly, if in the year 1800 Europeans did not have a significant technological advantage over Muslims or Indians or Chinese, how did they manage in the following century to open such a huge gap, technological gap, between themselves and all the rest of the world? When Britain began to build railways and modern industrial f factories? Why were France and Germany and the United States able to follow quickly after Britain, whereas China lagged behind? When the gap between industrial and non-industrial nations became a very obvious economic and political factor in the world, how come European countries like Italy and Russia and Austria managed to close the gap and join the industrializing club, whereas Persia and Egypt and the Ottoman Empire failed to do it. After all, the technology of the first industrial wave was relatively simple. Was it so hard for Chinese or for Persians to engineer uh, steam engines, to manufacture machine guns, or to lay down railroads? The first commercial railroad in the world opened for business in 1830 in Britain. It led between Manchester and Liverpool. 20 years later, in 1850, Western nations, Britain, France, Belgium, Germany, they were crisscrossed by almost 40,000 kilometers of railroads. At the same time, in the whole of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, there were only 4,000 kilometers. In 1880, 50 years after the beginning of the railroad age, the Western countries had about 350,000 kilometers of railroads. All the rest of the world together had only 10% of that. 35,000 35, kilometers of railroads. And most of these railroads were laid, were built by the British in India. Take China, for example. The first railroad in China 
opened only in 1876, 50 years after that railroad leading from Manchester to Liverpool. This first railroad was 24 kilometers long and it was built not by Chinese, it was built by Europeans in China. And the Chinese government destroyed it the year after it was opened. In 1880, 50 years after the beginning of the railroad age, the Chinese empire did not operate a single railroad line. Well, 50 years, too short a time for the Chinese to understand how important railroads are or to learn how to build and operate them? In Persia, we see roughly the same uh, situation. The first railroad in Persia, what is today Iran, was built only in 1888, almost 60 years after Britain, and it, was, it connected Tehran to a Muslim holy site about 10 kilometers outside the capital, Tehran. This railroad, the first railroad in, 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 uh, in Persia, was constructed by a Belgian company. In 1950, the entire railway network of Persia amounted still to only 2,500 kilometers, and this in a country which is seven times the size of Britain. What the Persians and the Chinese lacked was not technological inventions such as the steam engines. Even if they didn't know at first how to manufacture steam engines, they could easily buy them freely on the market. It wasn't a secret, there wasn't an embargo. If the Shah of Persia or the Emperor of China wanted railroads and, and, and steam engines, they could just buy them from the Europeans and then learn how to make them themselves. What the Chinese and the Persians and the Turks and so forth, what they really lacked was the values the judicial apparatus and the social political structures that took centuries to form and mature in the West and which could not be so easily copied and uh, internalized. France or the United States or Germany could follow very quickly in the footsteps of the British in the industrial age because the French and the Americans already shared the most important British myth and social structures. The Chinese and the Persians could not catch up with the British so fast because they thought and they organized very differently. This explanation sheds new light on the period between, say, 1500 and 1800 or 1850. Uh, during this era, Europe did not enjoy any obvious technological or other advantage over the Asian powers, but Europe was gradually building a unique potential whose importance became obvious in the 19th century. The apparent equality between Europe and China and the Muslim world in, in 1750 was a mirage. They may have been equal in their power at present, but their potential was very different. Think as an example about two builders who are building uh, towers using different method. One builder uses wood and mud bricks. The other builder is using steel and concrete. At first, when they reach just two or three or four stories, there seems to be not much of a difference between the two methods. Both towers grow at a similar pace and reach relatively similar height. However, once a critical threshold is crossed, the wood and mud towel cannot stand the strain and it collapses, whereas the steel and concrete tower grows on and on and there is no limit. This is the difference between the European empires and the Asian, and the Asian empires. What exactly was the unique potential that developed in Europe during the early modern period and that enabled Europeans to suddenly take over the world? There are two complementary answers to these questions. What is the unique potential that Europeans developed? Modern science and capitalism. Europeans already in the early modern era, before the 19th century, they became used to thinking and behaving in a scientific and a capitalist way even before they enjoyed significant technological advantages over other societies. When the technological 
the big technological inventions of the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution came along, Europeans were therefore in a much better position than anybody else to harness them and to use them. So it's also hardly coincidental that science and capitalism, these two unique potentials, are not only the basis that uh, uh, gave Europe primacy, they are also the most important legacy that the European empires left behind them in the post-European world of the 21st century. Europeans no longer rule the world today, but science and capital are still the keys for uh, economic and political success in the world. Well, again, I said so before, we'll discuss capitalism at length in the next lesson, so I don't want to, to explain anything about it here. The following segments of this lesson will be dedicated to explaining uh, uh, how exactly was uh, science and the European empires connected to each other and what were the advantages that science gave the Europeans even before the rise of technology uh, in, uh, uh, in conquering the world. <laughs>